<clears throat> Dear participants, uh, as Secretary General of my right, I'm very proud to be able to wish everyone most welcome to this launch of my right report, Peace for All, Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Peace Building. Uh, this is my right's second project in the area of disability and armed conflict. Uh, when we in 2019 implemented the first project, which was a seminar on this topic, we realized that there is very little research done, very little information available in this whole area. In this particular project, we have focused on two of my rights program countries, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sri Lanka, two countries with ongoing peace building work. And I would say that even though there are differences, the main problem is the same in both countries, the lack of inclusion inclusion of persons with disabilities and of organizations with persons with disabilities in the peace building process. And we will be able to hear more from, from many of the persons who have been involved in this work uh, in this launch. But before we start that, I would like to thank all of the organizations and individuals in Bosnia and Herzegovina who have contributed to this report. Everyone who has participated through interviews or through otherwise sharing information to the report. And also, I must say how much I appreciate the work of Leila, Leila Hadzi Message, who compiled all this information and was the writer of the, the report that we are now launching. And last, but definitely not least, I want to thank all the staff at my right who have been involved in this work. This includes Binasa and her colleagues in the office in Sarajevo, as well as Ingela and Sandra, who you both have met already and who both have been instrumental both in the production of the reports of these projects and in the organizing of this launch. Now I will give the floor to Binasa, who will give an introduction to my rights work in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. Yes, Benasa, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to welcome you all. I'm, it's really a privilege to be today with all of you. And um, thank you, Jesper. So uh, it's really uh, great to hear uh, all what you said in, in front of all of us. And I would like to uh, join uh, you uh, in uh, thanking to, uh, of course, all who give uh, contribution to this report, but in particular, I would like to thank to all of our partners uh, who have been really, as uh, always, uh, close to uh, um, not only to us as my right, but also close to uh, Leila and her work. And um, saying this, I would like uh, to add on top what is uh, my um, task today to share with you is uh, to introduce the work of my right uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in order to um, remember all of you that all what we are doing uh, right now uh, also in regards to this project, it's uh, actually work done together with our partners and all what we succeed uh, also, this report will not be possible without uh, this um, immense support and work together. And that's it from the beginning. And uh, if I'm looking uh, back to uh, what my ride done so far in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, some of my colleagues will laugh because this is uh, really true. It's not easy uh, to sublimate everything in five minutes, definitely. But I believe that it's good to say a few things. Um, if you think about uh, peace building, um, I believe uh, that the work uh, uh, of our partners, uh, the work of uh, representative of coalition, so through the joint activities work, uh, we already contributing a lot to the peace building. And I'm sure that uh, some of my colleagues will be able to talk about that, probably Leila and Zuka more, more in detail. Um, and. Um, also something that is uh, extremely important on behalf of what we've done so far, and it's 
in regards to this report, one of the reports my right uh, done together with, with the partners, it's actually important on working on monitoring of human rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, why this is important? Because all these process give a contribution not only to uh, findings and uh, relevant evidence-based uh, information on uh, situation of uh, not only persons with disability, but organizations uh, of persons with disabilities, but also give uh, contributions to uh, those who are advocating in the rights. So without evidence-based data we will not be able to make a change that's also why this is extremely important that's something what uh, it's uh, my privilege to working uh, in my right and with the colleagues we've been able to contribute during the years so i will just mention uh, monitoring of human rights uh, on persons with disabilities uh, uh, use one specific methodology, Disability Right Promotion International, or abbreviation DRPI. And that methodology uh, and that work in very holistic monitoring um, give uh, uh, to our partners, to uh, 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 coalitions of persons with disabilities, tool and knowledge and more uh, information how to advocate for the rights. Uh, not only for that, of course, uh, this work uh, gives a specific contribution in building capacity towards not just the person, as I said, but organization as, as themselves. And on international level allowed uh, for the first time uh, movement uh, from Bosnia to present uh, in very structured and well done report, uh, uh, alternative report on rights of persons with disability. So all these findings, all these activities we've been implementing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we will not be able to do if our partners, uh, organization and persons with disabilities are not willing and keen to do that. So I'm uh, slowly finishing this, what I just want to uh, share with you, just one part of what we've done so far, by concluding that uh, nothing without us, <laughs> nothing about us, uh, we really followed in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, as um, Director Jasper said, uh, we understand that there is no much uh, information in this field, how organizations uh, of persons with disability really being included in peace building. Uh, and thanks to this report, we will have more information on that. But not only that, we will continue and they will continue in fighting uh, to change uh, maybe this um, not so well situation right now and showing to those who are maybe not um, aware how much organization of persons with disabilities already contributing in peace building, which we are very much aware of. So thank you all one, one more time. And as I said, it's really my privilege and an honor to be together with you and to collaborate with you. So thank you. Thank you, Binasa. Uh, thank you so much. Um, now uh, we have come to the uh, agenda item where I will present a little bit about the international study. Um, and uh, I think my colleague Mia will, yes, will share the, uh, the presentation. You see you. it now. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, it, the presentation has also been shared in, in Bosnian, uh, um, you should have it, uh, but we will only um, share uh, the English one here. Um, so uh, this is an international study that my right has been implemented with funding from uh, the Swedish peacebuilding agency, the Folke Bernadotte Academy, uh, and it started in April last year and it will end in March this year. So it's a one year study project. Um, and the aim of this study has been to facilitate access to knowledge, uh, policies, strategies and approaches to inclusion of persons with disabilities in peace building. It has also been uh, to gather and present the views and perspectives of uh, organizations of persons with disabilities and their members uh, on how they feel that they have been included in the peace processes. 
Uh, and then finally, also to provide recommendations, uh, foremost to UN agencies, but also to other international stakeholders on how they can become better at including persons with disabilities in peace building and making sure that their rights, needs and perspectives are taken into consideration and also that they uh, can uh, participate in a meaningful manner. Um, and then uh, regarding, uh, I don't know if I have to tell you, Mia, when to switch uh, the slides. Um, but yes, now please. We, yes, so I... now we are in the fourth. Um, so the implementation uh, process, uh, it has been uh, uh, conducted with a global mapping, which has been conducted by myself and my colleague Sandra. In this mapping, we looked at um, different, I mean, how the policy has uh, developed over maybe the 10, last 10, 20 to 10 years, uh, and also um, trying to find positive uh, examples on the ground in a few, few more uh, country contexts. So we looked, we conducted uh, what we call mini case studies of Colombia, Lebanon, and Ukraine, uh, and then more detailed country studies of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sri Lanka. And the two detailed country studies were uh, selected as we have country offices and long-term experiences in, in these two countries. And the other three were selected based on advice uh, from uh, other ex experts in this field, we thought it could be interesting to look into these specific contexts. Uh, for example, um, Colombia is um, uh, a post-conflict country who recently signed a peace agreement uh, that actually includes some references to um, persons with disabilities, which I will uh, speak of a bit more later in the presentation. Uh, so the global level uh, findings, um, we can uh, move into slide number six. Uh, so at the global level, and that is uh, a finding also that applies, of course, to the Bosnian context, but that is the lack of data uh, on persons with disabilities. And, and this is specifically a challenge in conflict and post-conflict uh, countries. And we see that international stakeholders need to work, work more um, and, uh, and support uh, state level um, uh, agencies, you know, in, in, in developing uh, systems for, first of all, uh, collecting and, and also analyzing data on persons with disabilities and not only of that population as a whole, but also with disaggregated uh, data on gender and types of disabilities, etc. Uh, and then the, on the next slide, we have uh, a finding saying that there is a high prevalence of disabilities in conflict affected countries, but few peace agreements include such references. For example, in the two detailed country studies that we conducted of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sri Lanka, we could not identify any such writings in the actual peace agreements. Um, and we found an international study saying that actually only 6% of all peace agreements in the whole world have such references. And one of those, and one of the most recently signed agreements is the Colombian one, and that one actually includes several references to how persons with disabilities will be included in the peace process. It does, however, not mean that it is easy to implement such writings, um, but at least to have it uh, a clear commitment on paper is, is helpful. Uh, and then on the next slide, we have uh, the finding that the adoption of the UN Security Council resolution uh, 2475 on the protection of persons with disabilities in armed conflict is an important policy framework framework to, to in order to strengthen the inclusion of persons with disabilities. However, we found in, in this study that um, this resolution has not been sufficiently implemented on the ground yet. Uh, so um, that is uh, a weakness that we have uh, identified. And then uh, on the next slide, we have some positive, uh, we have seen some possible 
positive developments in terms of institutional strategies, uh, such as the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, the European Union and the World Bank have all adapted, adopted clear frameworks for how they, um, how they seek to ensure persons with disabilities, not only in peace building, but in, in all development cooperation areas. Mm. Uh, however, also here we see that these strategies are not always fully implemented on the ground and not always even known to the staff in the staff offices, uh, in, the, in the field offices, I mean. Uh, and then also we found that uh, quite few uh, civil society organizations have similar frameworks. They do work uh, uh, and focus on what they call vulnerable groups, but not as much on uh, specifically on persons with disabilities. Uh, and then on the next slide, we have uh, a finding saying that women with uh, disabilities are excluded in both policy and practice, uh, including in the various UN uh, Security Council resolutions on, on women, peace and security and in the national mm. action plans for the implementation. Do we have any? There are some, do we have some technical problems? Is everything okay? Because I'm receiving some messages here. I believe, I'm not sure. Um, we have technical difficulties. Yes. Oops. Shall I stop for a while and... I haven't had any message about it. All right. Uh, then I, because I'm almost done with the presentation, it's not a uh, lot left, but... Um, so uh, this is a, a common challenge that uh, if you see that persons with disabilities as a whole uh, are excluded, then uh, women uh, and and also certain other subgroups will be even more uh, excluded from, from participating. We have, uh, however, found a few uh, positive findings, for example, in the way that we found an international or a research paper on, on the Liberian uh, peace process. And there we could see that uh, women with disabilities had been included in some way in the de decision-making process. So we are always also looking for positive exceptions uh, in order to showcase how it could be done uh, in a better way. Um, and then we have a few uh, global level uh, recommendations. And that is, of course, to work with, um, with state uh, responsible authorities in conflict and post-conflict countries in order to compile and develop disability related data. We would also like to see strengthened advocacy and lobbying on inclusion of persons with disabilities uh, and ensure a collaboration with organizations of persons with disabilities. Um, we have also found that it's positive to mainstream the rights of persons with disabilities into every uh, institutional strategy and uh, project in a similar way that many organizations are working with gender. Um, also, it's positive to appoint specific disability inclusion focal points within the organizations that can lead their work and advise uh, their colleagues on the matter. And then also for the fields of peace building, democracy, governance and others, even hum uh, humanitarian uh, relief work uh, to work more uh, together on, in cross collaboration on these issues, because many of these fields, they overlap and not all of the uh, case examples, for example, included in, in this study are exclusive peace building programs. Uh, we tend to also def uh, have a quite broad definition of peace building. Uh, and then lastly, we would like to see donors to uh, have uh, requirements on implementing actors uh, for disability inclusion. And that includes also to ensuring that there are sufficient budgets uh, for accessibility costs. And this was also 
specifically requested by the implementing actors, UN and civil society organizations, because they said that if the donors do, do not request this, it's difficult for them also to argue for such um, costs. Um, that is uh, all I had to say right now on the global level. Uh, we will have uh, a larger um, launch event of the global study next week. Uh, but now we will mainly focus on our country-specific findings. So, then I will uh, leave the, the word um, to, um, to the partner uh, organization, the Association of the Blind, Blind Canton of Sarajevo, who will uh, and give its remarks. And I believe uh, that Fikret would like to speak in Bosnian, if I'm correct. Um, uh, so Fikret, yes. uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and then I'll ask the uh, translator to swap to the English channel so that we can hear the translation in English. Um, and Fikret, you will stay in the Bosnian channel. Let's hope that that works. <laughs> yes, it will. Can I start? Yes, you can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hvala. Um, yes. My name is Fikret Zuko the director of the Association of the Blind of Sarajevo Canton. And for many years, I have uh, been a part of this movement of persons with uh, disabilities. I've been blind uh, ever since I was born. And I have a lot of experience uh, regarding the lifestyle of persons with disabilities. I've been, I have been uh, in this movement for almost 40 years and I have a lot of experience in this work. Um, and at the very beginning, let me uh, reflect to this presentation by Mrs. Binassa. It is true that without us persons with disabilities and organizations of persons with disabilities we would have been we, we wouldn't have been able to achieve many important results in bosnia and herzegovina but also without the support of my right and our friends from sweden we wouldn't have had the opportunity to even try to do something because we wouldn't have resources for such activities it's important for us to be together when it comes to uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, our coalitions more or less include organizations that have existed for a long time. And we can view their work in three parts. The pre-war part from the socialist era, when we had the completely different conditions for work. Uh, the democracy was different if it existed at all. And then we had uh, the wartime period when we focused more on humanitarian activities. And also there is the post-war period, the past 20 and more years, where we have had attempts to develop democracy, human rights and multi-partisan system and ca capitalist society in Bosnia. And when it comes to organizations of persons with disabilities, we didn't manage quite well in this environment. When it comes to the Association of the Blind uh, of Sarajevo Canton, I was fortunate because as early as in 1997, we cooperated with SRF and previously Shia and currently My Right. I have a lot of experience from Sweden and also they suggested certain things to us when they visited us here and this influenced a lot uh, the entire movement of the persons with disabilities in Bosnia and Herzegovina because we did something that we never believed we would have been able to to develop for example an alternative report 
which is a very good report in our opinion and generally and it uh, actually gave rise to certain recommendations for our country which are good and acceptable to us but uh, it requires a lot of advocacy uh, in order to have these implemented eventually. And through our work with my rights and coalitions and our partners from Sweden, we actually learned on how to advocate, uh, how to implement uh, conventions, how to obtain support from the state and from our members. So all of this was achieved thanks to the cooperation and joint work with people from Sweden. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to increase the level of engagement uh, uh, of uh, persons with disabilities uh, and to bring it to a satisfying level. We can talk about this later uh, when it comes to peace for everyone and the development of cap capacities. This is some this is a process this enabled us to view certain things from a different perspective we were we're not thinking about whether we were included in the peace building processes or not we worked on it we did what was necessary for persons with disabilities in general and if i tell you that back in 1997 two years after the war we managed Maybe we were the first in the country uh, that uh, established some joint organizations with the Republika Srpska and so on, uh, multi-ethnic organizations, actually. Uh, so this is genuine peace building and a work on reconciliation, I would say. We have many joint meetings, conferences, analysis, sports events, cultural events, And we do not care about ethnic or other differences. However, our politicians do not see things in, in the same way. Um, the NGOs do work in this direction, but our politicians certainly do not. And when politicians do not work on reconciliation, the institutions don't either. This is why our cooperation is very important. And throughout this process, we realized that we can contribute much more to uh, the peace building and reconciliation, knowing that our work is also a part of this process and that it should be intensified further. I think that this process has been very useful. We had focus groups, we talked to Leila, we had some analysis, we heard many things that we didn't know before. And just like learning about gender and advocacy, this is a new thing to us. And I mean, it's a new knowledge for us. We worked a lot on reconciliation and we have just realized that this was the case actually. And also what tells us that we have good intentions and a good path is the fact that we meet a lot and discuss different problems. Uh, we often joke a lot. However, the circle of people working on these issues is very narrow. And many members of this movement, many persons with disabilities do not have the required knowledge to get involved. And many organizations of the disabled don't have the capacities to join the process of peace building or advocacy. They mostly focus on some local level issues, um, some medical issues, um, humanitarian issues, and their capacities are simply on an adequate level uh, yet. This is why the My uh, Right project actually uh, works on strengthening of capacities of organizations in, and individuals and this guarantees to us that we will succeed in the long run and that um, in our contacts and work with institutions and politicians and the NGOs that occasionally work on issues of the disabled that 
we will achieve huge progress and that this will ensure that persons of disabilities are involved in the policy making and so on. So what are the problems here when it comes to international organizations and other donors? In most cases, organizations of the disabled do not receive projects. NGOs in general receive funding for projects. They are projects project focused and they just realized that disability is a popular issue now and then they introduce some elements in their projects related to disability but not in accordance with the convention they do it in a way in order to present this as a mainstream in order to obtain funding for their projects and then when they include persons with disabilities or organizations with disabilities, we realize that they don't have adequate planning. They don't plan for assistance. For example, if there are 15 persons uh, with a disability, it means 30 persons with the disabilities. And also they have to think about adequate capacity of conference rooms and costs and so on. Generally, in the world, it is deemed that um, the disability shouldn't incur, incur costs, additional costs on persons with disabilities. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Bosnia. If I want to attend an event in Bosnia, I have to provide for myself uh, an assistant, a uh, prize uh, script, uh, and many other things. And when the donor, when I tell the donor that this is the case, they tell me, well, we didn't plan for this. They didn't consider persons with disabilities when they were writing their projects. They didn't think about persons with in, wheel, in a wheelchair. Uh, that they didn't think about sign language for the deaf. And uh, they didn't think about the needs of the blind. Um, and of course, in such cases, persons with disabilities cannot get involved. So often, such organizations, when they plan their events, they do it in a way which doesn't provide access to persons in a wheelchair. And then these people have to be carried, this affects their dignity, and they will decide not to attend the next event, of course. So uh, I think in Bosnia, uh, the international donors and organizations, when they talk about human rights of persons with disabilities, they should uh, contact organizations of the disabled and consult them. And when they analyze the propo project proposals, they should always uh, check whether all the necessary elements are included in order to ensure the involvement of persons with, uh, with disabilities in the process. If this is not the case, and if uh, our government doesn't take some serious steps in that regard. And if we don't engage in uh, serious advocacy activities, we will be increasingly ex excluded from these processes because our politicians, as a rule, only do what they have to do when they are exposed to our pressures and advocacy uh, uh, in order to uh, enable us to equally participate in the society. When it comes to inclusion, in general. There can be no inclusion without accessible association, without adequate aids, adequate training of the disabled, and without serious work with the media that should increase awareness of citizens uh, of the fact that persons with disabilities are equal citizens. They have their rights and obligations and they should be included in all processes whenever possible. And in mo most cases, it is possible. So we insist on this as much as we can and believe that the international organizations and some NGOs will help us in this and that all of us together will manage to change the environment in Bosnia and Herzegovina where uh, the disabled are still not even close, or at least in the most part uh, of the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, they are not even close to uh, exercising some major rights and becoming equal. 
uh, and they're not even close to achieving the inclusion that we advocate for based on the conventions and some documents adopted in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's all from me for now. I hope I <laughs> said the most important things. Thank you. Thank you, Fikret. Um, and I will ask uh, the translator to go back to the Bosnian channel. Uh, that's okay. Um, all right. Um, so now we have uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, and that is the presentation of um, the country case study in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which Leila will be uh, kind enough to share with us. So I will give the floor to you, Leila. You are still on mute. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Leila Hajimesic. I uh, was honored to be part of this project uh, since uh, May this year. Um, and uh, uh, before I start with my presentation, I have to say that uh, as someone who has worked on issues related to human rights protection, mainly in Bosnia over the past 20 years, this is one of the most empowering experience I've had because I've had an opportunity to talk to uh, to the coalitions and, and, and their members of persons with disabilities uh, to see their views on this very important topic in our country. Um, and I had an opportunity to triangulate those views with the, with the interviews I had with the international organizations and uh, civil society organizations. So it was very, very um, exciting and empowering for me myself to be able to 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 hear different views about this um, situation in the country. Also, as, as someone who has been who is from Bosnia and who went through the war and and lived in post-war uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, I believe this this topic of peace building is extre extremely important even today, even so many years after the war. So. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to go through the presentation and, and the main findings we had at, uh, during the study, uh, hoping that this will uh, possibly um, help uh, in future work of peace building when it comes to inclusion of persons with disabilities. Uh, bear with me for a second. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh-huh, here it is. Just a second. Ah, here. Um, so basically, uh, since um, uh, July uh, this year, we started uh, with the BH country study. Uh, in, as Ingela said, uh, we did a parallel study in Bosnia and Sri Lanka. So we had, in terms of methodology, we had the opportunity to discuss a little bit the approach and, and how we go about this. Um, uh, it's very important before we go to the findings to, um, to explain what the aim of the study was. Uh, basically, through a list of questions, we try to uh, assess and analyze the capacities, policies and strategies uh, on the inclusion of persons with disabilities among key UN agencies, but also other relevant international organizations and, and national stakeholders that participate in peace and reconciliation process. Uh, once we did that, um, it was important to gather and present the views and perspectives on the needs and interests of, of, of persons of persons with disabilities through their um, organizations and constituencies, and to provide the recommendations at the end on, um, on what would be the best way uh, forward in this regard. Uh, in terms of methodology, Oh, there's a problem no? I can hear the voice. Um, Sorry, we had a late participant. I'm trying I to see. Mute yeah. a moment. Uh, Bear with me a moment. I think yeah. it's important for all of us to have uh, to muted microphone and sometimes happen that people forgot that and unmute. So please hold a mute microphone if you are not speaking. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, basically in terms of methodology, the first thing we did was to map the existing data on the implementation of relevant uh, international standards in BIH when it comes to this topic. Meaning uh, what I did was uh, uh, to conduct a, a thorough desk research to find out what are the current and, and previous major peace building initiatives in the country. Um, uh, with, and then to try and identify whether persons of disability, with disabilities are included in these processes. Um, once we had that first broad list of, of peace building initiatives, then we proceeded with um, uh, primary data collection, which is establishing contact with the different UN agencies, um, uh, other international multilateral organizations in Bosnia. Uh, civil society organizations and of course organizations of persons with disabilities. So uh, basically what, uh, before I start with the key findings, it's important to say that I'm going to be going through them, but trying to present uh, the findings based on triangulation, which means that uh, the information I, I gathered from uh, different organizations dealing with peace building, I tried to triangulate them through uh, very extensive focus groups and discussions uh, with persons with disabilities, organizations of persons with disabilities and their members. And what I also wanted to mention is uh, this process was very important and very broad, the consultative, consultative process with the organizations of persons with disabilities in a way that we organized uh, numerous uh, focus groups where we try to discuss this issue with uh, uh, ensuring that we have um, participation of uh, representatives of persons with different types of disabilities, also uh, to make sure that we have representatives of civilian war victims and war veterans, meaning persons who became disabled uh, due to the war. Uh, and uh, we also had separate focus group uh, with youth with disabilities and another one with women with disabilities because we also wanted to see their uh, views and aspects that affect them particularly within the group of uh, persons with disabilities. So when it comes to the country context, uh, we all know this is not a global study. Uh, we all have been in Bosnia for um, uh, working here uh, along. So we all know about the Dayton Peace Agreement that ended the conflict. But we also know that um, uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement ended the, the, the conflict as such, but didn't uh, help um, much with the uh, ethnic divisions and, uh, and generally socio-political situations in the country, which means uh, uh, narratives related to the war rhetoric uh, are still very much present, ethnic divisions are still very much present, and in this situation um, it, it, is, uh, it is very difficult to talk about uh, stable peace and sustainable peace. Uh, for example, I took out this example at the local level, uh, we find very deeply divided communities uh, and, and, and these wartime legacies and ethnic cleavages basically continue to over, uh, have, uh, overwhelm the situation in a way that uh, somehow all the other issues are, are pushed aside. Um, the situation when it comes to uh, international uh, treaties uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as we know, has signed and ratified uh, all of them, to my knowledge. Um, and but the problem is at the implementation level. At the implementation level, again, we had the very strong uh, nationalistic um, rhetorics linked to the to the very often linked to the war legacies, which basically impedes the implementation uh, adequate implementation of international uh, human rights treaties. So that's more or less where the situation is placed. Now, when it comes to peace building, we know also that there was, uh, there has been a large uh, international presence in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, uh, with numerous efforts to 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 uh, implement properly the Dayton Peace Agreement and to ensure sustainable peace. So one of the examples is the Annex Seven of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which was uh, to ensure the return of all refugees and, and internally displaced persons to their pre-war homes. Um, 
then uh, there is uh, international justice, meaning first in the ICTY and then in, in the BIH courts, uh, war crime prosecutions. And then of course, a lot of institutional reforms that were meant to, to, to secure uh, sustainable uh, peace. Um, in all this, uh, we discussed all this with the, with the organizations of persons with disabilities because it was interesting for us and, and for me as well, how they felt about all these processes, whether they were part of these processes, whether they were completely neglected, whether they feel they wanted or didn't want to be part of, of some of these processes. And basically, uh, Mr. Zuko just talked now, but I remember him saying that uh, when it comes to Annex 7, he remembers that at the time they were trying to help persons with disabilities uh, return to their pre-war homes. And they didn't expect back in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, that uh, there would be any specific measures in place for persons with disabilities when it comes to accessibility to administrative offices and all this, because the country uh, just went through the war, um, it was very poor and, and everything was very much ad hoc, uh, you know, trying their best to put the country back into the, its feet. So they didn't really expect any special measures uh, on the part of the authorities. So what they did as the, as the NGO was to um, help all persons with disabilities who were willing to return uh, to repossess their property and they were helping them uh, fill out the, the papers, bring them to appropriate offices and so on. Um, apart from that, uh, we looked uh, very closely into the work of the UN agencies in VIH, in particular a program called Dialogue for the Future because this is one of the biggest initiatives um, related to peace building since the end of the conflict. And uh, basically, um, I conduct, we conducted the interviews with the, the three agencies of uh, the UN in Bosnia and Herzegovina that uh, participated in the implementation of the uh, Dialogue for the Future. For those of you that are not very familiar with, although I doubt, I think everybody knows about uh, the FF, uh, basically, uh, it started in 2014. The first uh, program started in Bosnia and Herzegovina started in 2014 and lasted until 2017 at the initiative of the BIH presidency. And uh, the, the project was called Promotion of Coexistence and Diversity in BIH. Uh, it was meant to create space for dialogue, build uh, understanding across the country, promoting coexistence and respecting diversity. Following on that positive example, um, um, the UN started with the regional uh, program, also uh, UNDP, UNESCO and uh, UNICEF, uh, but this time UN country teams of three countries uh, participated, which is uh, Serbia, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this is uh, the program that was particularly interesting uh, to us. And also the, the aim was the, to support the dialogue and collaborative action around uh, uh, jointly identified priorities, very much focus on uh, empowering youth uh, for greater social activism uh, and, and engaging youth in constructive um, engagement in leadership. Uh, what does this mean in practice for us? It means that um, uh, the focus on, and this is what we were told by the UN, and this is the understanding that the way for for the UN through the implementation of Dialogue of the Future to ensure participation of different vulnerable groups was to apply uh, so-called social cohesion. Uh, social cohesion basically uh, meant uh, tolerance of, difference, of difference and acceptance of the value of diversity. Uh, by doing so, uh, they wanted to go beyond uh, ethnic uh, divisions and beyond uh, divisions between different marginalized groups and beyond exclusion of marginalized and vulnerable groups. Uh, because they believe that if, if we take the approach of social cohesion, we will basically have, at least in theory, uh, participation or at least we will allow the, the space for participation of uh, different individuals and groups uh, without looking into their ethnic group uh, and, and, and other divisions. Um, uh, throughout the, you know, the interviews and the, and the analysis of the evaluation of the FF and, 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 and other information available, we learned that uh, 
this process uh, brought much uh, better uh, uh, participation of different groups. Uh, particularly, there was an UNDP initiative in grant giving. They were giving grants for different uh, CSOs to participate in the um, in, in, in this program, and they uh, basically put inclusion as fundamental principle. Uh, it was an eliminating criteria. Um, and this brought, uh, 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 I would say, good results uh, in terms of participation of different vulnerable groups. However, uh, having discussed this, this issue and also the, the, the dialogue for the future throughout our uh, focus groups with the organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, we learned that uh, this cr inclusion criteria served a purpose to a certain extent, which means um, uh, CSOs were encouraged to, to ensure participation of vulnerable groups. Now, this is to me one of the key findings of this study. It is not, and I think Ingela mentioned it also at the global level, it is not sufficient to only talk about vulnerable groups if we want to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities. Because what uh, came out as, 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 a, as a key finding, I would say, especially talking to the organizations of persons with disabilities, it is necessary uh, to take uh, uh, several uh, steps and concrete actions in order to ensure uh, really meaningful participation of persons with disabilities. One of them is to start with accessibility to information, because what organizations of persons with disabilities often stated to me in, in these numerous conversations is how would they even apply to participate in any activities related to peace building if they are not aware of them. And the way to make sure they are aware of them is to either maintain uh, regular contact with the organizations of persons with disabilities or and or to adapt all the information to uh, to the specific needs uh, of, of persons with disabilities so access to information it was the key uh, the second thing is uh, physical accessibility which uh, which also, as Mr. Zuko said, I don't need to repeat uh, what he said, but it is important to mention that uh, uh, if uh, we don't adapt our activities and initiatives, and I'm sorry to say this, I, I link this to the UN uh, Dialogue for the Future, but this finding uh, applies to all, uh, all, all actors that uh, work on peace building. This is not just the UN. Uh, basically, uh, physical accessibility, as Mr. Zuko was saying, if, if we don't secure physical access to, for example, uh, people with wheelchair, then they will have to be carried, then their dig dignity will not be the same, that they, they, everybody will be staring at them, and the next time they won't participate. And another thing that is very important also is uh, uh, what, what we found out, and which also the DFF evaluation showed, that uh, CSOs were very present during the, and, and very active in, in the implementation of the Dialogue for the Future as implementers. But what perhaps uh, should have been much um, uh, more efficient is if somehow they were uh, present during the project uh, or program uh, design stage. And this again applies for all, not just for the UN, uh, that basically, uh, if you have persons with disability with you as, the, as, a, as, a, as an organization that implements, uh, uh, designs and implements a peace building initiative, if you have persons with disabilities with you from the start, they would be able to inform you about the specific needs they have so that uh, you will plan everything in the project design stage already. Because once, as we all know, those of us that participate in, in, in project designs and project implementation, that uh, everything has to be planned in detail from the start. So if we don't um, plan the budget, activities, personnel and all this, then we won't be able to accommodate the needs of persons with disabilities once the implementation stage starts. So Mr. Zoko mentioned it, but I will repeat it again. For example, um, people with visual impairment uh, need an assistant to be with them. So uh, we are talking now budget, we are talking now practicalities, as I called in, in the report, technical issues. Uh, 
at the project design stage, we need to plan 20 people instead of 10 participants because each person with visual impairment will have to bring an assistant, otherwise they won't come. Um, and, and so on. We can talk about physical accessibility adaptation for, but I, I guess you get the point. I don't need to take too much uh, time reg uh, related to this. So uh, this is uh, this is the, 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 the sort of uh, key. And then, yes, to mention also before we move on, uh, a very important uh, key, a uh, very important information, which is uh, empowerment. And this is what Binasa talked about. And this is what Mr. Zuko talked about. Uh, we cannot expect uh, uh, just to, to open a call for persons with disabilities to participate unless someone worked on their empowerment. And this is something that to me is also key, not just for peace building overall. Um, if, um, if none of us um, invests efforts in empowering persons with disabilities through their civil society organizations, then um, the participation will remain only on paper, but it won't be meaningful. Uh, another issue that is very important that I need to bring up, which is very, very specific to Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is, uh, uh, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with the legislation, but basically what we tried to look into uh, during this study was also um, the legislation uh, treats differently persons uh, with disability who, who uh, uh, became uh, persons with disabilities due to the war, as opposed to those who um, have disability from, from, other, uh, per, from other causes. Uh, in a way, uh, I can see it as someone who has uh, worked a lot on transitional justice, if you look at it at the in, in transitional justice context, uh, it appears that the, the, the legislator tried to use uh, social uh, welfare laws to deal with reparations within the context of transitional justice, which then created discriminatory practices between these two groups of persons with disabilities. Uh, so we basically looked at this issue, assuming that if the legislation already makes this division. Is there such division in terms of the extent of the participation of persons with disabilities in different, uh, in different uh, uh, peace building initiatives? Leila, uh, just yes? one second, because we have one participant uh, raising his hand. So I just wanted to check whether uh, okay. his name oh, is- Oh yes, sorry, Mr. I can see as well. Mr. Uh, Kovacevic, isn't it? Yeah, maybe you can ask him in Bosnian if he has any troubles or if it's just a mistake? Okay. Uh, Gospodin Kovacevic je tražio riječ. Ja sam dobro svatila. Mr. Kovacevic, have you asked for the floor? It seems uh, not. So just go on. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, um, we try to look into this issue, assuming that if the, the, the legislation already makes division, whether there is such division in, in different peace building initiatives. And of course, uh, if the premises for each peace building initiative is talking about the war, which sounds logical, there is nothing problematic about that. But if the premise of peace building is to talk about what happened in, during the war, whether we can find common ground about what happened and, and overcome, uh, you know, deal with the past in this way, then it is logical that uh, participants of such initiatives are people who uh, uh, gained disability during the war, because they have first-hand experience and they have a lot to say about their traumatic experiences and the consequences and how they live today in, in Bosnia today and so on. Um, so yes, uh, we found that many, many peace building initiatives include indeed uh, war veterans who tell their stories, who get together, who uh, try to, uh, to find uh, common ground for the future and so on. But uh, what we found, and this is the social cohesion uh, approach and the human rights based approach that we found in the uh, dialogue for the future as a positive one, which is basically opening space for the dialogue of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina today, because it, uh, it's been uh, 25 years, more than 25 years since the war ended. 
And uh, it is important to work on memorialization. It is important to talk about truth uh, telling, uh, you know, to, to organize truth telling initiatives and to deal with the past in order to be able to uh, move towards the future. But at the same time, uh, it is, if we want to talk about stable peace, if we don't talk about peace only as mere absence of, of weapons and absence of war, then we talk about broader terms, which is uh, stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina today. And this is what I was told by uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, but also um, uh, one uh, civil society organization that we had a, a very interesting conversation about this, which is uh, Caritas, because they co-implement a, a, a big project with other civil society organizations related to uh, peace building. And the main premise is to try and also, they also have truth telling initiatives, but they also work on uh, talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina today. What is it that would make us all feel that we live in a stable and secure environment? Uh, and, and if we approach peace building from this perspective, then there is space for all. Then there is no space only for those that directly participated in the war. Then it wouldn't be a, a sort of premise that we only talk to civilian war victims and that we only talk to war veterans. Another uh, finding that I think is very, very important is that during the mapping stage, when we, when we try to identify all the peace building uh, players in Bosnia, actors in Bosnia, uh, uh, I try to establish a contact with the many civil society organizations. And a lot of them, I would say majority told me, uh, no, we don't exclude or discriminate against any specific groups. Uh, we don't. Uh, we we have our program or our project open for all. Anyone has uh, uh, an opportunity to access our project and to participate in it. Uh, and then I asked further: Do you have any specific strategies or programs uh, with a specific fo focus on how to include persons with disabilities? And they didn't have it. So to me, this was uh, <clears throat> a finding in itself because. Uh, to me, this indicated that, yes, these organizations genuinely don't intend to exclude anybody, including uh, persons with disabilities. The problem is, we go back to what we uh, mentioned earlier, which is uh, there need to be a number of preconditions met and specific needs met in order to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities. So this, uh, we understand the, press, the civil society organizations that have this approach because they, they, they genuinely don't want to exclude anyone. But if their information about their project, as I said earlier, is not adapted to persons with disabilities, then they will not even know about it. Uh, so that's where we identified the need for, you know, strengthening the capacities of uh, and, and expertise uh, and, and the need for closer cooperation between organizations of persons with disabilities and civil society organizations that deal with peace building. Uh, if, they, if they join their efforts, they would be a lot um, uh, more effective uh, approach. Uh, another thing now we're moving to the purely, I would say, the, the perspective of organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, what I think we will all know living in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but to me it was a finding in this context as well. Uh, they told me that uh, they feel that persons with disabilities are generally excluded from decision-making processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that the, the, underlying, the underlying cause for that is the misperception in society that being disabled basically means being unwilling or incapacitated to participate in decision-making processes. And that when I asked them about peace building, they felt that it's just yet another process where they're generally excluded. That they don't think they're excluded from peace building processes because someone has something against them because they, they don't belong to peace building discussions, but that this is generally the, 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 the perception of, of, of our society, unfortunately. And I could spend hours now sharing with you um, hard breaking, uh, but also very uh, powerful um, discussions I had in some of the focus groups. I will just share one. Um, a young uh, a woman, a member of uh, an organization of persons with disabilities, uh, wanted to discuss uh, programs of the new government, newly elected government in the local authorities with the newly appointed mayor. 
and she scheduled a meeting. And he, at the beginning of the meeting, he, he informed her that even in his pre-election campaign, but even now that he's appointed, he's uh, planning to continue with the humanitarian assistance to persons with disabilities. And she responded to him, I would appreciate if you first uh, made, uh, adapted the elevator in your building to persons with disabilities so that we can access your office anytime and start discussing what we need to discuss when it comes to priorities of persons with disabilities. And to me, this was one of the most um, illustrative uh, examples of where in fact the misperception comes from. Uh, because the, the misperception comes from the idea that uh, persons with disabilities are, I'm not saying everyone thinks that, but general misperception and they're, they're, they're feeling that this is where the problem comes from, is that basically we, when we see a person with disability, we think either, oh, they don't, uh, they, they have enough trouble in their life, they, uh, they certainly don't want to be bothered with discussing peace building, that's one. And the other one is, uh, let's organize some humanitarian aid and some social, you know, uh, assistance and social welfare for these people. Uh, because they, they, why would they, why would they, you know, discuss peace building in the first place? That is one thing. And the other thing, also, I had a, a, an honor to talk to uh, uh, two um, young people who participated in dialogue for the future, and one of them told me, uh, and I even put the quote here: "If we don't impose ourselves in peace building initiatives, no one will even notice that we are not there." So basically, she told me she participated in the dialogue for the future, but uh, she really uh, uh, pushed for it. She really wanted to, to be part of it. And, and, and she genuinely uh, did what was in her power to impose herself to be part of such an important initiative. And, and she was thrilled, uh, you know, at, at, of, of, of her experience. And uh, yeah, the project design I already explained. Uh, broader definition of peace we already uh, discussed basically that the idea is and that's one of the recommendations you will see that uh, basically um, uh, if, when we design the, the peace building initiatives in the future it would be very useful to uh, to to define peace in a bit broader terms meaning uh, um, do we have sustainable peace now not only what happened back in 93 let's discuss and uh, to me, uh, the most important point at which I will end with the, the findings is, uh, Mr. Zuko already mentioned it, I uh, was really amazed at the way they described to me during the focus groups on their own, what I called internal peace, peace building process. Uh, and Mr. Zuko mentioned this, um, after the war, they basically realized that they are left on their own because the country just was devastated by the war, uh, the, the public institutions were poor, everything was destroyed, and they figured that no one will take care of them. So what they did is they started establishing contacts with each other in different uh, throughout different ethnicities, also in different entities, different cantons, uh, to see whether they can somehow exchange information and be helpful to each other, like share positive experiences and what they learned, their lessons they learned and so on. Uh, because what uh, one of the very active members in, in, in the coalition told me is that disability is universal. And as such, it supersedes all other differences, ethnic, religious and others. Uh, and this, it is exactly because of this universality that persons with disabilities immediately after the conflict started working together across ethnic, entity and ethnic and religious divides. Um, and the last thing, and I will also link this with what Mr. Zuko said earlier with the example, uh, basically uh, they, they all told me that uh, they feel that there is no reconciliation in this country because the politician, it is not in the interest of the politicians to re reconcile because they like these uh, inter-ethnic uh, tensions, which is what keeps them in power. And uh, I had uh, an opportunity to, to discuss peace building with war veterans who told me uh, numerous uh, very, very positive examples. But one of these for me was really enlightening that they organized the uh, sports activities, volleyball and, and, and uh, basketball sitting volleyball and basketball in, in wheelchair across et, uh, different ethnicities and they organize competitions at the national level and, and many of you certainly know that they won many medals at the international level and that uh, basically 
by doing this, they showed uh, that reconciliation is possible because war veterans are the ones who directly participated in the war, who directly, not literally, but you know, uh, broadly speaking, uh, it could be assumed that they even were shooting at each other during the war. So if shooting at each other and becoming disabled, and after that uh, organizing sports events and living together is possible, then the mainstream politics could and should have also reconciled by now. So having in mind all this, uh, we came up with a set of recommendations for different group of our stakeholders, and we hope that uh, they will be useful for the future. Uh, when it comes to the UN agencies, as I said, uh, uh, with the social cohesion, uh, the approach is really, really um, uh, welcome and positive. Uh, uh, what the UN agencies could do in the future is look at the recent documents, the UN Security Council Resolution 2475 and the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy. Um, both of these documents were adopted in 2019, so they're still relatively new, as I said. Uh, so we, we extracted several uh, uh, concrete actions that could be taken into account uh, for uh, by the UN when they uh, de uh, design their future peace building initiatives. And th uh, these are, in short, you will see in the report there, there are more details, but uh, briefly, information and communication, physical accessibility, stigma and social exclusion, data collection and budgeting. And I think this is all linked to, to all the findings I, I went through uh, before. Uh, <clears throat> apply a mainstream approach. Also uh, dedicate further efforts to mainstream inclusion of persons with disabilities in peace building related projects and programs. Because this may help to empower persons with disabilities uh, where they are able to engage in community dialogue on topics such as uh, peace building and reconciliation. Transforming the organizational culture, and this is something Ingela mentioned already, awareness raising and trust building and uh, human and financial resources. Because if we have persons with disabilities as project staff and or if they're included in the project implementation structure, they can sensitize the staff on practical needs, ways and means of inclusion that can lead to greater focus on inclusion of persons with disabilities. When it comes to uh, the other international institutions and national and international civil society organizations, as I mentioned before through the, throughout the findings, it would be useful to make the information about peace building projects assess, accessible to all persons with disabilities, <coughs> uh, both through establishing and maintaining close contacts with organizations of persons with disabilities and through adapting the information on their needs in uh, uh, such as Braille alphabet or sign language. And that they should contrib continue contributing to the narrative that peace is not mere absence of war, but a concept that ensures an inter-ethnic trust, stability, freedom and rule of law in today's DIH. In this way, all persons with disabilities will have the opportunity to participate in peace building initiative rather than uh, only those who became disabled due to the war. And this is another thing I have to say uh, before I continue that we discussed in the focus groups with persons with disabilities. Not everyone will want to participate in, in, in peace building initiatives. But as one of them told me, look, but not everyone in all the citizens of BIH want to participate in peace building initiatives. It's not about that. It's about being given an opportunity to participate. And then it is up to us to decide whether we want to participate or not. Uh, where possible, allocate additional resources during the project design stage uh, uh, aimed at increasing capacities, resources and expertise, aimed at meeting special needs of persons with disabilities to ensure their participation in peace building processes, ensure the participation of women and youth with disabilities, as well as equal participation of persons with, dis uh, with different types of disabilities in these activities. Uh, civil society organizations should develop disability inclu inclusion policies and strategies in accordance with the relevant international standards. And here I'm linking this to the finding we had that uh, the CSOs don't intentionally exclude persons with disabilities, but without uh, providing adequate um, 
accessibility and other issues we mentioned, there will be no meaningful participation. And uh, this to me is very important, ensure cooperation between civil society organizations dealing with peace building and organizations of persons with disabilities to overcome lack of disability related expertise in implementing projects. Because I think it's not realistic to expect knowing how civil society organizations have to apply for funds, how the, the local uh, authority grant giving scheme is not reliable and, and so on. It's not realistic to expect that now each civil society organization will hire one person with disability all the time to be there and advise them on how to do proper disability inclusion. So in lieu uh, of this um, uh, cooperation between organizations of persons with disabilities with the CSOs would be very useful because it would be at the mutual interest. Here I particularly mean um, youth organizations because we somehow believe that youth is the new generation that can bring a stable peace um, uh, in, the, in this country. And uh, if it's already youth as a group, it would be very useful if youth organizations can, uh, can, can uh, join their efforts together. Uh, continue, continue contributing to a comprehensive and inclusive peace uh, narrative. Uh, in BIH, with strong focus on inter-ethnic trust building, universal human rights, uh, justice and rule of law. Use best practices of in inter-ethnic cooperation between organizations of persons with disabilities from different ent entities and ethnicities as a way to promote reconciliation and to share these experience with civil society organizations and international peace building organizations in BIH. Where possible, consider participating in available project calls for proposals in the area of peace and reconciliation. Encourage youth with disability in civil society to take an active role uh, in advocacy and activism as they could become a driving force for a more active engagement in peace building. Uh, these were the recommendations for persons, organizations of persons with disabilities. But before I end, I would just like uh, to add, keep up the good work. Uh, you really changed my complete perspective on activism after I had this amazing opportunity to work with you for the past six months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila, for that presentation. That's very informative and it's been wonderful to work with you throughout these months as well. Um, and um, now I'd like to open up the floor for some questions. Um, and uh, like Ingela said in the beginning, we, we just for, for, for easier uh, management, we'll try and do it in a bit of an order. Uh, so we'll start with um, anyone who would like to ask a question using sign language. I know that I checked in the beginning of the meeting if we had any sign language participant users, but I don't believe we had. Uh, but if someone has joined in late, uh, please do let us know either through communicating with the sign language interpreters or please write your name in the chat and we can take any questions that you might have. Um, I'll give it a bit of a moment for, to see if we have any participants who wants to ask a question. Can you stop sharing, please? That would be easier for us. Yes, fantastic. Leila, can you stop sharing your screen? I am trying. <laughs> <laughs> I am doing my best. Fantastic. Wait, but I, I, I thought I did because here it says new share. Just a second. I, I'm, I'm confident. Ah, here. I'm, yep. I knew. I knew I was capable of that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries at all. All right. So, sorry, go ahead. Uh, if we have anyone who wants to, uh, I will swap my view as well so I can see, but I don't quite believe we do. If not, we can always come back. Uh, uh, I do see someone waving. Is Amir, did you wave wanting to say something? No. <laughs> Not yes, I would like to say something. Thank you very much. If none of the colleagues using sign language would like to do it before me, I'm ready. Let me say a few words. I would like to thank colleagues from my right for somehow 
introducing a system into these issues. We heard from a colleague Zuko who said that many things were done uh, on peace building in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In some cases, we didn't even know that we were working on peace building through different activities and projects. I would like to briefly remind you of a good example. Maybe it wasn't explicitly mentioned, but it is globally important. It is the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the advocacy for the adoption and implementation of international agreements on disarmament. I will mention the Convention uh, on the Prohibition of Landmines and advocacy activities were intensified uh, at the end of the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and a series of organizations from Bosnia participated in the international campaign for the prohibition of landmines and in the advocacy activities for the adoption of the Convention on the Prohibition of Landmines, which was adopted in 1997. So we in Bosnia have people who participated in this campaign and their work was recognized by the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize back in 1997, which is fantastic. So I just wanted to remind you of this fact the, this convention is very important and this work on uh, global international agreements on disarmament because this was a precedent because persons with disabilities who were the victims of arms were included in the advocacy activities uh, for, for the adoption of the agreement and for the first time they were a part of this international agreement. Their rights were recognized as well as the obligations of signatory countries to work on their empowerment during the agreement implementation. And this precedent later became a standard when uh, a few years later, other conventions on the prohibition on bombs and nuclear weapons were adopted. I think the three years ago, Ago, the Coalition for Campaign Against a Nuclear Weapon also received the Nobel, Nobel Prize. So from the perspective of my organization, from uh, Banja Luka that I work for, this was actually a concrete way uh, of inclusion in peace building activities through the advocacy for the implementation of this agreement uh, on the prohibition of landmines. This was just a small digression, which is very important in the context of this whole story. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. And, and, and I agree with you. It's very important. I don't know if perhaps Ingela or, or Leila wants to make a comment as well in response. Um, I want to thank you, Amir, for, for that comment. And it seems that something that we might have missed, you know, uh, to exemplify in the report. Uh, so I think that we should discuss in our team, Leila, Benaza, and me and Sandra, after this meeting to see uh, what we can do about it, you know, in order to capture this important uh, achievement in a better way in the report. So thank you for, for bringing this up. Thank you. Um, and if anyone else, I think we'll move on and, and continue on, on the Bosnian language track. So if anyone else would like to ask a question in Bosnian, it can be translated into English as well. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, ask a question, either write your name in the chat or, or simply uh, speak your name uh, in the group as well. That works just fine and we'll give you the word to speak. There's a raised hand from Mr. Kovacevic, but maybe that's an old one. We'll have a look and see if he would like to say something. Uh, it has been raised for a while, oh, so... It's an old hand. Absolutely. I think so. Okay, good. Um, then if nobody else has a question, I believe we can open the floor in general. So if you have a question in English as well, uh, you are more than welcome to... Uh, Yes, and I would just also like to add that it would be good if you would um, let us know who you are ad addressing the question to. So either to Leila or to Binasa or to me or maybe Jesper, so that we know who should answer it. Let me have a quick look to see if I see any raised hands or anything. Let's 
cell fix like we don't then I don't know Ingela if you want to say a few more words um, in, in case we see anything more in terms of questions or if you want to say any concluding words um, no one has any question or comment it seems a bit quick to to already end it here, but maybe someone of our colleagues who has a question. listened to the presentation has a comment, or maybe Jasper or this uh, raised hand from Alma Mirich. All right, Alma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I I put my comment in the chat. Uh, greetings to everybody. Just to say on behalf of the Joint Regional Program Dialogue for the Future that we are happy that you have focused and explored elements of our program that focused on including persons with disabilities. And, you know, certainly listening to Leila's presentation to this entire event and reading the report has given us a lot of food for thought. And we will draw lessons from this for our future programming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alma. Um, it's interesting uh, and good to hear. Um, it was very also uh, interesting for us to look into your program in, in detail and learn both about the, the positive uh, aspects of inclusion and, and the remaining uh, challenges. So thank you for sharing also and participating. I'm just having a look in the chat and for raised hands as well, make sure I don't miss anyone there at the moment. And if not, feel free to speak out in case I'm missing you. <laughs> In case uh, there are no uh, immediate questions, I would like to ask uh, those of you that participated in focus groups with me to uh, tell me if I reflected all of your uh, uh, concerns expressed by me, if there is anything you believe you would like to use the opportunity to add that you might have not heard from me today. Perhaps not. And if not, they can always share share that with us after this meeting as well. Um, now I see a raised hand. A Hazim, uh, is that correct? Uh, if you'd like to speak, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, and take the floor. Uh, I would like to say that Leila mentioned pretty much everything that we mentioned in our focus group. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's good to hear. Uh, all right. Let me just scroll through again. I have everyone on a row up top, so I just want to make sure I don't miss any raised hands. Uh, No, not at the moment. Um, right. Uh, then I would like to ask uh, Jesper if he would like to have some final comments. Otherwise, I think that we should thank all the participants and uh, and uh, yeah, and and the meeting. But we had Jesper, a, do you have any comment in the chat as well? Uh, thinking for a useful presentation um, uh, and. Uh, 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 saying that she would unfortunately have to leave at the moment, but thank you for a useful presentation. I uh, just wanted to convey, but yes, yes, but do please go ahead if you have. No, I think my only comment is that of thanks to all of you again who have participated in the work, both to produce the report and now to, to present it. I think that it's, it's an area that, as, as I said before, we haven't seen that much written in or that much work done. Uh, although I'm sure this is certainly not the first time someone is picking up this issue. Um, we were very lucky to have this 
financed by the Turkey Bernadotte Academy. I should have thanked them too, of course, on my initial words. Uh, I, I, I say I'm, I'm grateful to them, but I actually do think somehow that they are also a bit thank grateful to us uh, because we are doing something that hasn't really been done that much before. Uh, and I think that we can see a bit of a change in attitudes in, in different areas of work where people seem more aware now than 10 or 15 or 20 years ago uh, aware of, of the need to work on the rights of persons uh, with disabilities um, and that this opens up for certain processes to be more inclusive. But it's also very, very clear that we are really not at all where we should be um, on this and there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, work within the disability movement, but even more so and more uh, outside uh, work done by the well, United Nations, by other CSO, by states, etc. And, and uh, I can just hope that we have someone somehow been able to contribute a little bit to, to at least to the awareness of, of a number of individuals who will bring this into their, their work onwards. Um, but again, thanks everyone and uh, I will for the, the seminar uh, for this launch, particularly mentioned Ingela and Sandra, they have been struggling to get this functioning. Uh, thank you also interpreters. Uh, but of course, I'm very grateful that so many of you others came here. It would have been quite um, a strange seminar with my right people and interpreters in the room and no one else. So thank you everyone for spending some of this afternoon together with us. Uh, see you sometime, somewhere, in some other circumstances. Bye for now. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for today.